Thank you, Deputy Mayor. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, I will try and take you from a. I'm not. Well, I have come to see now. Uh, Right, I want to talk about uh, the way that heritage and creativity are part in various ways, and I want to look at that a bit more closely and analyze a bit what the problems and dilemmas are of using these two things together. Now, one of the big problems we know, which is why we're having this conference, is that culture is not our operating system. It's usually treated as a bit like decoration rather than the core of what we all do. Now, if you assess and look at the success and failure of cities globally, you probably can say there are five elements that make places rich and interesting. One, when they are a place of anchorage, obviously that's to do with heritage, stability, home, tradition. Places of possibility where people can do things uh, achieve their ambitions and so on. Places of connection where different social groups are part of the making, shaping, and co-creation of their city. And there are places of self-realization where you really do more than you thought you could. And finally, occasionally they inspire. Now I think these are principles that cut across cultures and time, and in that sense, they're timeless. I think we all know that places without memory are places that feel quite empty in one way or another. And that memory may be a Chinese memory, it may be a European memory. And the interesting thing is, of course, how the old and the new connect, which is why you see often, for example, the Singapore Library rooms, which are called the possibility or why also in terms of connection, we have to build connections between different cultures, because as cities get larger and more global, of course there are many people there. And then obviously this self-realization, learning institutions, and occasionally uh, some place of inspiration. Now, of course, if you add everything together, what people say about cities, they're contradictory. On the one hand, they're calm and tranquil, on the other hand, vital, edgy, etc., etc. Sometimes they're spiritual and soulful, but too rarely, and hopefully they're walkable as well, and well-designed. These are the words people say they want when they talk about cities. And the interesting thing is that yesterday's innovation, when done well, is often today's classic, as you can see here in the Eiffel Tower, where lots of innovations made then are still used in city building. And of course, cities have always been creative. Uh, that's obvious. The difference between then and the past and now is that we are self-conscious in saying we want to make and be self-consciously creative. But the central issue, the big issue, the central question is, of course, the city is the most complex cultural artifact and its values communicate in every fiber of its being. So, these are Chinese cities we know, and Hangzhou is obviously doing things differently. And in a way, these buildings, everything here, reflects a cultural view of how we should live, what places we want, and the decisions we have made in order to create our cities. Now, this idea of building cities like that is of course a modern idea, a modernist idea which started with great confidence but in many places has turned into the opposite, a kind of dystopia and this is the result of what we've created. These are cities we've probably been to. We didn't want to plan this but this is the result of our planning and the values we put into making our cities and that's why we create places that feel not very human. Uh, this, of course, is in, in Dubai. I mean, it looks interesting in some way, but it's very difficult to walk around, etc., uh, etc. Et 
So this is the cities we have, and even Paris, you know, looks a bit like that. But if there's a problem, put some red public art in front, that might make it look better. Um, and then occasionally, like here in another city, uh, paint the past in the metro, just so you remember what the past was like. So that's really quite sad in a way. And then of course the effect of that type of building is that we only have one world and most of the cities I'm talking about operate as if there are five worlds. And one impact, this is Venice a few years back, is this, as the same things may happen to Shanghai in 30 years time. I call this City 1.0, just to use computer language, which is hardware driven. It's the urban engineering approach to city making focused purely on function. Now, engineering is fantastic, but we need other skills and insights if we're going to make things called cities, which are places. And as you can see here, this is a radical arts project in Paris. It says, in brands we trust. And so in order to make that city more spectacular, of course, we heighten it through having lots of things to shop. I have nothing against shopping. But there is the interesting connection now between, of course, luxury brands, art, and fashion. Here with Yoyo Kusama and Louis Vuitton. It's quite interesting at one level. At another level, it reminds us what is art for, what is the role art is playing in this. And the same is true for Prada, Tiffany, Salvatore Ferragamo, and recently, we were, some of us were in Florence, and Ferragamo also has a museum, which in this case is showing Marilyn Monroe. So even the brands are trying to give themselves more purpose and meaning. This is the Gucci Museum there. So you're trying to make a bag or a shoe seem more important than a bag or a shoe. The other thing is, as everything becomes trendy, the words like Soho, South of Houston Street, originally, that's what it meant in New York, is used for everything. Soho coffee, Soho shops, Soho bar, Soho Galaxy in Beijing just opened Zaha Hadid. This is the Soho Galaxy. So even the word Soho, with the meant interesting, is now become a brand. I saw a Chinese restaurant recently in Korea called Soho. Anyway, you get the idea. And here in Zurich, you can't see it probably because the picture's too small, there's a Renaissance hotel, and the one single building left by an artist, they put resistance in the same writing. So you put resistance, renaissance, together. But it is emblematic of the issues we're talking about. So we need to have a different approach. Let's call it Plan B. And Plan B, unfortunately, is very difficult. Because the cities we love and the words I gave you before, we cannot build anymore because the economic dynamics, I will not say forbid it, but they make it extremely, extremely difficult. So that's one of the central dilemmas of Plan B. I was in Beijing a few days ago and I asked people, there were 250 people there, I said, do you like straight lines or curves? 80% said they liked curves. Only 20% said they liked straight lines. But all our cities are based on straight lines. So this is another one of these little funny touches. So there are some real difficult issues we need to address here. And what really matters is to address the wicked problem. The extremely difficult problems that we must address and we do not know the answer for them. And that is the role of culture, a cultural approach, and creativity to deal with those issues and ideally through co-creation. And as Albert Einstein said, the thinking that got you to where you are will not be the thinking that gets you where you want to be. So what is City 2.0? I can again use this computerized language. It's something different. And graffiti is also quite helpful. Here in Belgium is a graffiti that says, capitalism is chaos, anarchy is order. I'm not saying that's correct. <laughs> But I'm reminding ourselves that the street artist often is quite interesting. So the remedy, if there is a remedy, is really about soft urbanism. Let's call it that. 
and retrofitting conviviality, the art of living together as strangers and friends in the same place. And this involves thinking of the city in a different way, where you combine hard and software thinking, where you start with the emotions and you start from the experience of the city itself. And those that understand experience need to be just as powerful as the property <coughs> investors and others. And this is about atmospherics, of course. It's about putting soul back. I mean, how many times have I heard the word soul in the last week? Everybody said, I need some soul in my place. I need some sense of belonging. But essentially, because of the past paradigm, which seems to eradicate soul, soul is really important. And that soul can be reflected in the physical environment and many other ways too. But the difficulty is that so many of these things we're talking about are very difficult to prove in simple numbers. They're intangible, they're often invisible. But in total, we need to therefore revision how planning works. Different types of people need to come together to plan together. Rethink the resources we have, and that was a good example you just heard, redesign how we think of city makers, particularly reorganize governance and how we represent who is represented in making decisions about the city and not working in our own little boxes, and therefore telling a story of a city that compels the citizens to want to be part of that story. Now, therefore, every city, and this is Shanghai Expo, has been rethinking where is it going? What should it do? How do we connect nature and the city together in some new type of way? How indeed can we have some new, better ideal of the city? Now, of course, this is happening in the context of dramatic transformations that you all know of. And the main one is perhaps the rise of China is one of these major transformations. But the world, of course, is in a variety of ways in motion. In motion in every sense, in terms of people. We're all living in a smaller world in some way. With different religions, different views of life are sharing the same space at the same time. And that is a global culture that is sometimes empty, but sometimes very compelling and interesting. And all of that affects, of course, the sense of identity that people might have in the place they live, which is created and recreated again and again. But if we add these things together, you have to say, the city 2.0 requires a paradigm shift in thinking. Now, in the old approach of thinking, there was one idea, one production unit, went to household, and that was very simple. That was a simple one. But the newer world and the way we produce things and make things and create things and work in networks is far more complex and more entities, people cooperating and collaborating. And that world that looks different, and I'm only showing a graphic representation of that difference, operates also in a different way. One element of this is the here-there phenomenon. We are both here, physically in Hangzhou, but there, virtually somewhere else. And these guys are typical of that. They are working just somewhere for somewhere else. And there is this instability which you see through pop-up culture, and even offices can move. A very interesting German invention you can move your office around on a trolley. And, and this is part of that whole movement of open source, innovation, and other things. But it's about a clear period where ideas generate more wealth than perhaps we used to think. And what it implies as well, a different sort of idea of how things connect, which we could call network thinking. But of course, all of this is incredibly fragile. In the past, we had a very predict and provide model. We will build 10 miles, 10 kilometers of road, boom, in one year. Now it's much more about preparing for the unknown and creating the possibilities for places to be resilient. And that is the 
zeitgeist, the spirit of the time that we're in. Now, creativity in this context is much wider than what we're normally talking about. It includes thinking afresh, a creative bureaucracy, and all the other forms of innovation we know, including new business models, social innovations, etc. Essentially, a culture of creativity in a city. And that implies that we must switch the question. I know UNESCO needs evidence, I know that. Francesca, where are you? You need evidence. I know that. But I never answer the question anymore, what is the value of creativity? What is the value of culture? I never answer that question. I only ask, what is the cost of not thinking about it? And what the cost is, is precisely the disgusting, horrible, terrible, unlivable places we have just seen. That is the cost of not thinking about it. And that puts the argument on the other foot. The person who's always making you, all of you here, argue for this, it makes them have to respond to this question. So what makes a great place? A great place is a place which has some oxygen, some lifeblood in it. It is a place that has magnetism, which makes you want to be there. It's a place where you want to and can meet, talk, play, transact. And that's how also, of course, business evolves. So in that context, creativity is a currency. It's a resource. It's a different type of asset. It's a different type of form of capital. And when we think of this creativity, the first starting point is to allow the citizens and everybody to be curious from which imagination grows, out of which we might have interesting ideas, from which an innovation might evolve. So curiosity is absolutely key. But this is also a place where hidden resources come out, where you discover them, you let them come out, you let them be explored, and where these creative minds, and what is a creative mind? A creative mind is an open, flexible, fluid mind which knows when to be open and when to be more closed. And this place creates the conditions within which we can think, plan, and act with some form of imagination and finds precisely the imaginative solutions to opportunities and problems. So yes, of course, let's fill this time with artists, but let's also ask, but why, who, what, what are they doing, who is this for? Let's ask all these questions at the same time. And like here in Venice, it says, let's not make boring art, but let's, of course, have a lot of it. Of course, I agree. And of course, in that context, of course we want to renew things like swimming pools and turn them into museums where we can then perhaps have shows on the water, like here near Lille. That's one interesting creative example. But the danger of having all the old buildings becoming museums is a very important danger. And therefore it's so important to reuse the past into the future, like here in Helsinki, which was world design capital this year. And I find it interesting in Beijing that you have an actual square which says originality square. So you be original when you are in this square, which is quite an interesting thought. But anyway, you get the idea. But here is an example from the Netherlands, an old place, textile museum, which I thought would be boring. But in fact, it's a center of textile innovation using the old machinery and having the past and the present. And the museum director was an anthropologist, which seems to be quite significant. Or here in Rotterdam, another one of these places, ugly perhaps, which has in fact become one of these factories of creativity. And the reason is, is because the pattern of the past, in a sense, merges with the future. And you find that, as Jane Jacobs said, new ideas of the new old buildings. So the same is happening everywhere, but there is the danger of gentrification. This is Berlin, and what it says here, this is a squatted building on the right, saying how long is now, next to a Kunsthalle, which is basically an exhibition hall. So there is a big tension and fight going on there about that. What will be developed? 
or hear what will be one of the new global icons in Hamburg, where the Philharmonic is in that warehouse and 13 stories of apartments will be on the top of this building. It's interesting, I must say. So anyway, the other part we know of the cultural creative economy, which is a vast sector, the gaming industry, simulation, clusters of music like here in Istanbul. But the question is, is it the creative economy or is it creativity in the economy? A vast difference between those two questions. Now, of course, I believe the creative economy, creative industries, these sectors like design and so on, are like electricity and can add value to many other sectors. But we can talk about that later. But I just want to make that distinction about creativity in the economy. But basically, a creative city is a place that allows ordinary people to make the extraordinary happen if given the chance. And that requires, at times, thinking at the edge of one's competence and not at the center. Finally, I want to explore with you how I think all of this fits together. And I'm calling this civic urbanity. And civic urbanity is this traditional idea of urbanity, of the right to the city and responsibility for the city, which degraded over time. It's a classic idea, very Italian idea. And it has a few components. The first is cultural literacy, understanding diversity and openness. This is the other invisible hand. The invisible hand of culture, which is the DNA, which is both an obstacle and an opportunity. That, of course, is a dilemma. How can we have these unbounded dialogues? How can different religions talk to each other with mutual respect? How can we meet each other halfway? How can we talk across difference? How can we understand the other? And how can we plan, looking through that intercultural lens, to make a different city? The second big element is the shared commons. And I'm delighted that Hanjal mentioned how everything is open with no fences. That is that which is beyond the self, which is not about egotism, because it is about the city as a whole rather than me. And that is reflected in public space, but also libraries and so on. But it involves this trust, this urban trust between the citizen and those who make decisions. The third element is eco-consciousness and healing the environment, which has to, of course, be more than just having green grass on your tram. It's really about retrofitting the whole economy, which I'm glad the latest Chinese plan is focusing on. But here in Freiburg, perhaps in Europe's green city, they have a place called the Sunship, which is a massive development, which is co-designed by artists and architects. And it is car neutral. Or here, again, in Britain as an example. The key point is, can I see that this is eco-consciousness in the physical fabric? The fourth element of seven is healthy urban planning. This is planning that says as the first question, and what I am doing, going to make me healthy without having to go to the gym. We don't want to go to the gym. We want to do normal life and become healthy in negotiating our city. Now, most physical environments are not like that. And this is why, for example, the High Line in New York has developed, which has become one of the most popular things in the city, which is why calling something fat burger is not a very good idea. And why, when I saw this in an American city which said National Walking Day, I was so delighted. But then, it was urban active, having machines to walk, because the city itself was impossible and unwalkable. So therefore, this is the opposite of what we want, which is why, like here in Chicago, people are completely shifting the way their city looks and feels. The fifth element is the aesthetic responsibility, the responsibility of developers and others and investors to be responsible for beauty and ugliness. If they make it ugly, they should pay. 
If they make it beautiful, they should be honored. But beauty is an old-fashioned word. I know we can argue about it, but I prefer to have that in the conversation rather than nothing. How that works depends on where you are. That Bilbao example is an interesting one. Puppy in the spring, puppy in the autumn. Anyway, this can be trivial, like here just some paint in Tirana, but it can be more complex, this thing about aesthetics, and we could discuss that later too. But this is an interesting building in Helsinki. This was voted the ugliest building in Helsinki, and the most beautiful, because it was made by Alvaralto, the icon of Finnish architecture. And all that reminds us of is, yes, what we want is the debate. We want the discussion about that, which will enhance things. I've said enough about creative city making, which is my sixth element. And the final one is a reinvigorated idea of how democracy works in cities themselves. And that is about thinking about rules and regulations in fresh ways, making things slightly less complex, involving people more in how their city is made and created, getting everybody to bring something to the table, and in a sense having a way of telling an urban story. Not just being the person who builds a car park, like the person being there on the right. So, four key final messages. 360 degree interdisciplinary thinking rather than sector thinking. Thinking in the round, holistically. Second message, thinking of capital in a bigger way. If a project makes money just as an individual project, project, but reduces social capital and heritage capital and creativity capital, it is losing money, a totality of it. So reconceiving the capital balance, finance capital is not enough. So there needs to be a realignment in how we think about that and how we can add value, add value simultaneously to every project and any project we do. The third message is we must think beyond the purely functional and think about things that give us some sense of bigger purpose. And finally, let the physical environment speak to us so we understand what the intention, the values of the city in that. This is Malmo Western Harbour, carbon neutral. It has its typical icon, but in those apartments, rich people and poor people live together but you would not know who is who, which is ideal. And you can see on the ground how that all works. So if we think of it in this way, Plato said, the city is a work of art. I would like to add a word, a living work of art. So that is a completely different platform, I think, in total. And it's not therefore about money. It's really about thinking afresh. Thank you very much.